So hi, my name is Einat Orr, and I am uh, going to talk to you about uh, reproducible data at scale. Uh, actually, we're going to do two things. I would be speaking for about 10 minutes, providing the concepts. And then Amit, that the ones of you who arrived early have already got a pick off, uh, would give a demo. So it is a recorded demo because I have my share of demos not working in conferences. I have learned to bring a ready demo that is recorded. And Amit is giving that demo with unstructured data and how it, data version control can help that at scale. And of course, during and after, I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, so um, why are we talking about reproducibility, or to be correct or focused, data reproducibility at scale? It's because during uh, a work of a data scientist, this property of the data becomes very handy and makes the work easier, more focused, much faster, and less error prone. And why is that? So uh, as a data scientist, by the way, I was an algorithms developer myself. So I know what it's like. You have all that amount of data that is uh, stored uh, remotely. And you take a subset of it, not necessarily a statistical sample, but rather a subset that is consistent with the space that you are now trying to train your algorithm or your model with. And then you go on and you do the training. Uh, you create a certain model. And you then want to stop or save that version, and then the problems begin. So you put your code in Git. You have some stuff, parameters, that you've probably managed to uh, log into MLflow. And you have the version of the data, so you maybe copy the data to the side, maybe remember the list of files by name. Whatever you do is something that is manual and error prone. And I'm sure uh, if you've been doing that long enough, you've all experienced the, where is that? And is that what I really think it is? I mean, it's called a not final, final version two. Is that what I'm looking for? Hmm. And then five hours go by and you're still looking. Very good use of your time as PhDs in mathematics, physics, whatever it is that you have spent your time learning. All right, so uh, what we actually want to do is to be able to manage the data the way we manage the code and possibly the parameters using MLflow, using a system that will allow us to version control the data and then just commit the version of the data that we were using and easily go back to it. Because when we don't have that and we have this manual thing, we go, of course, on our iterative way, which is how we work, right? We create another version of the model and, oh, sorry, and another version of the model and then all of those things are somewhere, either on our local storage or on the remote storage and there's no real way of managing that. So we wanna get to reproducibility, to collaboration, uh, to good auditing, to have proper documentation and of course to be able to efficiently experiment with the data itself. So how do you do that? How do you manage data the way you manage code? You use an open source project, there are a few, I will present one of them today, that provides data version control. So the concepts that you have in Git, just implemented to data. To the data that you have saved on your S3 bucket, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob, Minio, one of our favorite partners. So wherever it is, you can definitely version control it there. So the data is there and the data stays in place. You don't need to move the data anywhere. What you do is you add an abstraction layer over the data and that is the version control system. LakeFS is the name of the open source project that I'm presenting today. And it provides Git-like operations, so now you can branch a repository of data and get your isolated environment to work on. You can uh, commit the data at the end of the work, and then you can go back to that commit ID together with the Git commit ID and the MLflow commit and know exactly what you've done in that experiment. No more searching for anything. It's just there and it's available and it's available together. And of course, you can merge data. This is uh, very powerful if you are testing the quality of the data or if you are running pre-processing of the data before the training begins. Basically, you will, you will keep on using all the uh, tools that you've been using until today. This is a very, very partial list. I mean, there's uh, 
limit to the amount of logos one can put on a slide. But anything you could think of is supported by LAKFS. So you continue to work the way you worked. But you can either access directly the data as you did until today, or you can access, in the cases where you want to, a repository that is defined on the data version control system. And when you do that, the only thing you have to change is the way you access the data, because now you are managing versions. If you want to access the data, you need to specify the version of the data that you would like to access. In this case, it says main because of the main branch. That would be for our, the way we recommend it, the production data. But it could also be uh, experiment 175 or some meaningful name that you have gave your experiment and you can go back to. Um, and um, you can do that, of course, through a CLI or through a UI or through an API, whatever you feel comfortable with. It could be done directly through your notebook. So you don't need to change the, your environment. You don't need to run an, another system. You can just have everything configured in your notebook. And then how it works. See, this is very important because I did mention that one of the solutions that we all use is copying data. So a data version control system, not just this one, any one you would use, does not copy data. It provides a layer of metadata, which is actually pointers to your data that allow it to create an abstraction of commits and uh, branches and uh, so on, right? So how that, would that work? So at the beginning, you would want to bring your data into the data version control system. And by bring in, we don't, of course, mean copying it. We simply mean creating the pointers to the data you already have, right? So that would be the import command that would create those pointers. And now you have actually listed everything that you have that you would like to version control. And then you do your work and you change stuff. Uh, in this example, a very, very simple example, let's assume we changed one file. Because storage is immutable, it would actually mean you are no longer using the version of the file that started with 799. That's just the hash of the content. And you are now using a different version of the same file, starting with 6.2.3 in green. And what the data version control system would do is simply point to the same files in the cases where nothing changed, and to the right file that you are using in this commit ID when uh, you are committing. So we now have two commits. We have a deduplication of the storage. Nothing is copied, but we have for the same file two versions, one used in one commit and the other used in another commit. Uh, to those of you who are worried that over time you will accumulate too many versions, so clearly when you delete a commit, you don't, no longer need it. You can, run, you can run garbage collection and clean the data from the storage itself. So storage usually reduces when using a data version control system rather than grows because you only have the duplications that you need as versions. Anything else can be deleted and you have not copied anything. So there are no copies going around for each and every one of the members of the team. Okay, now to open a branch is simply to point to a commit ID. That's exactly how it works in Git. So that takes about three milliseconds, and here you have an isolated data environment you can work on, and if you are 100 people, you can create millions of those as you go along. It's highly scalable. It's just a pointer. And if we want to uh, go back in time for reproducibility, we simply mention what commit ID we had, and then we go to that set of pointers that brings us the right data. Right? So the concept is very simple and very efficient, and it can work with petabytes, hundreds of petabytes of data, exabytes of uh, uh, objects. It's really very, very scalable. Uh, and just to make it easy for data scientists who sometimes work locally, it also has uh, local capabilities. So if we have the remote storage versioned, we can then do Lake City a local clone and copy the repository locally, work on it locally, of course, make changes. And once we commit, those changes would definitely be saved back into the storage and influence the branch that we were working on. It's like a local copy that you can then export back its influence to the main um, storage. Uh, there are also mount capabilities that come with that, so that you can have a folder for, a, for the versions that you were running, and you can just access them as if they're local, although, of course, it's just a mount of the remote storage. 
So everything to make it very easy for you to work and not change anything except getting the concepts of data version control and integrate those logically into your work. Uh, and what we're going to do today is I'm going to show you Amit giving a tutorial uh, and uh, he would show how he's using LakeFS for a specific use case that he will soon uh, specify so I won't steal his show. Uh, if you want, you can get to that repository from here and then if you want to try it yourself or do it yourself, it's all of course available. LakeFS itself is open source so everything is available for you to use. It's very easy to install. Within the demo, um, Amit uses the cloud version. Uh, it's simply because if you just want to uh, experiment, it's free for the first 30 days. So you can spin up a cloud in two minutes and then just do the sample. You don't need the installation. But everything you see is, of course, fully open source. And you can also do it with a local installation if you prefer to install the product. All right, now the challenging part of getting the video to work. Hold your breath. Hmm. Okay, so I have edited that to bring the specific information that I wanted you to have. If there, if there are a few jumps along the way, it's probably because of that. Uh, before I start, are there any questions or? Uh, no. All right, so let's start. Mm -hmm. Should I turn this off? We don't have the voice, un unlike earlier when we did. Uh, that's my problem, you're saying. I turned the volume. Uh, so the thing I turned down was the volume, this thingy. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I thought I was bringing it back to the beginning. No, that was not what I was doing. Let's try again. <laughs> now I will bring that back to the beginning, hopefully. Yay. OK, so let's start <laughs> uh, with the uh, demo. First thing, as you mentioned, you need this sample repository. Uh, this demo, whatever I'm going to show today is available on our Git repo uh, for sample repo. Uh, so you can run everything on your own. So let's quickly look into that. Uh, so we have lots of different samples, but today we are going to focus on this uh, a computer vision project uh, for image segmentation. So for and training the model uh, for to find certain things in images. In this case, we are going to look for the boats or ships in the satellite images. Uh, so if you want to run this as uh, this sample on your own, everything is available here, the notebook, all the information, setup information here. For this, you also need LakeFS, uh, uh, LakeFS server. You can spin up in the cloud very easily. It's a free uh, for 30 days. And once you sign up, uh, you'll get to this kind of view where in the clusters, you will see your uh, Cluster is LakeFS cluster is ready. So and just click on that link and it will straight away take you to this uh, LakeFS server uh, UI. So by default, you will have a sample repo uh, in LakeFS uh, server on LakeFS server. With uh, we also provide our own S3 bucket here for this sample repo. Uh, but if you want, you can use your own S3 bucket. Uh, there is a configuration required for, for cloud where you can bring, uh, connect to your S3 bucket if you want to. I'm not going to cover that here, uh, but you can use this bucket also for uh, testing your new repos. Let's say this is sample repo, but you can create additional repo in this uh, by adding us another folder within that. So that's on the just quick overview on how the to set up on LakeFS Cloud and LakeFS Server. The next thing is for this demo you need is the, the images to work on. So we did not post all the images because there are a lot of images here in this uh, sample data set. Uh, and we are using Kegel for this. And in, in Kegel, there's a Airbus ship detection challenge. So Air, uh, Airbus, um, they had this challenge some time back and they posted a lot of images, like around 200,000 satellite images with the boats in this. So it's a large data set, about 32 gig. Uh, so what you can do is just download this data set and upload into your S3 bucket. And so in this case, 
this is my personal S3 bucket. So just have this folder inside this Airbus ship detection, and then upload all those, uh, all that data set, which you download from Kegel. So that's kind of initial kind of get up, up to running, up, up and running. Next thing is uh, you will, uh, when you set up the uh, sample notebook or sample container, uh, here it will walk through all the setup instructions. It will create a local Docker container. So right now I'm running this, already running this container. Uh, initially when you run this container, it will take some time to build the container. Uh, but once you have it, then you can easily start. It will take a few seconds to start the container. Okay, so now I have my uh, image, this sample container running. And in this container, we have this notebook image segmentation. So that's what I'm going to use today. So that's kind of initial getting up, up to speed. So, okay, so let's uh, walk through this notebook quickly. So here I'm going to just ex explain the architecture, target architecture we are going to use for this demo. As you mentioned earlier, we took the Databricks blog, uh, which you can read on your own later. Uh, so what it provides in this, in terms of architecture, we are going to read the satellite images uh, as a binary data set, save that data set into Delta Lake as a Delta table, uh, and then uh, then use uh, transfer that to for training purpose for, uh, using PyTorch Lightning to convert data set uh, in the part, proper format so that PyTorch Lightning can understand that we are going to use a, a library called PetaStorm. And this was open source by Uber. So this will convert data set in a format that PyTorch uh, can understand. And also you can run that, it will work with the GPUs also. So it will convert into a format which will work for CPU as well as GPU. And then once we do run the training, when you run a lot of experiment locally or in distributed computing environment or in the cloud, we are going to record everything in ML flow, uh, all the experiment logging and what's the output of the parameters used for that training, what's the out output metric for this model, everything will be recorded in ML flow. So that's the very high level architecture. I think either talked about this, what we are going to show today. So first I'll start with the local experimentation. Uh, so let's get started here. In this notebook, we have a, a multi, three sections. One is configuration initially, and then setup, and then running the actual demo. So let's start with the configuration. Here you'll specify the endpoint to connect to the LakeFS server. As I mentioned earlier, I'm using LakeFS Cloud today. So this is my endpoint uh, here, which you can just copy this from here. And then you have the LakeFS access key and secret key. So you can go and create your access key and secret key. But just go to the administration and then click on create access key. I already did this in advance. So this is my access key and secret key. So I'm going to set those in the variable. In this notebook, then you specify the repo name. You don't have to change the repo name, but if you want, you can change the repo name. Next thing is when you create the LakeFS repository, you specify the storage for LakeFS repository, not for your data set. Data set can be in a separate S3 bucket, but this is where the S3, the LakeFS repository will sit. Uh, and this, you can use your own S3 bucket uh, or you can the, use the bucket provided by us, as I mentioned earlier. So this is the bucket we provided here. So you can just copy paste this U, uh, URL and then add the repo name at the end, or you can add another folder name inside this also. So you can use our bucket to create the LakeFS repository. So that's what I'm going to do today. Next thing is when you, uh, here there's a variable whether to specify whether you are running this experiment locally or in the distributed cluster environment. So right now initially I'm going to run this locally. So specify that variable here as local. For local training, I'm going to use a smaller data set. I mentioned earlier, that data set has about 200,000 images, but I'm going to use just the 100 images initially uh, on my local, so it will run fast. And then we can scale up to as many images as you want in the distributed computing environment. Next thing is the demo, uh, the demo data set I talked about, which is on Kegel. Uh, so as you upload into S3 bucket, you will specify your bucket name here. 
uh, and the region where it is stored and in the folder where it is stored. So this is my personal bucket here and the access key to uh, AWS access key, not the LakeFS access key, but the AWS access key to connect to that bucket where your data set is stored. Uh, so that's all everything in the config part. Uh, all these things we are storing as a variable, which we can, we'll use it further down. Next thing is the setup. Uh, for setup, I'm going to just uh, run this additional notebook. We have separate setup notebook, which has uh, imports the libraries required for this uh, demo, any functions, the helper functions that we need. It will also create the repository. So as you see here, it just created this repository in LakeFS. So if I go back into LakeFS UI here, and just refresh this. So now we have this image segmentation repo. Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, this is using our S3 bucket with the subfolder inside that with the repo name. So far, this repository is empty. There is nothing in there. So what we are going to next to next is import the data set into this repository. But we are going to also show the integration of LakeFS with Git. So what when I'm running locally, I'm going to create the Git repository. So first we did created the LakeFS repository. Now I'm going to also create the Git repo locally. So you'll see it in our container. It will create the folder for Git repository. So let me just create the Git repo here. So I have my repo here. And also if you go into your finder or the file browser, so you will see that also uh, that Git repo also available locally uh, also. So now uh, I think I have done all the setup part. So we have the LakeFS repository ready. We have the Git repo ready. And now we'll start the main demo. Okay, so what are, we are going to do is we are going to create an experiment branch in, uh, in LakeFS as well as in Git repo. And if you're running this experiment multiple times, you can just increment the experiment branch number here. So we are just going to create a local branch here in the Git, as well as the branch in LakeFS repository by using uh, branch creation uh, for LakeFS. So if I go back here under my branches, now I'm, I have my local experiment one branch in LakeFS repository, and also on Git, it switched to this local experiment one branch. Next thing what I'm going to do is uh, just read that data set. I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, such satellite images, we have about 200,000 images, so which is stored on S3. So right now what I'm doing is going to get the list of all those images uh, and then randomly select 100 images in this case for my local experimentation. But a lot of time people use the labeling tool to select those images. They don't just randomly select images, but based on certain criteria or certain labels, you might select certain images for your training purpose, or somebody might provide you a list of images to use for your training data set. That's what you can bring and then import into LakeFS uh, repository. So right now it's uh, just going through the list of uh, images in S3. So it's taking a little bit of time. So now it's done, so it's about 200,000 images. And then I'm going to just randomly select these 100 images for my experiment. And you can change this number of images required for experimentation. This was just the initial setup I did for 100. Next thing I'm going to import those images into LakeFS repository. While this is thing is running, the import process is a zero copy operation. So we are not copying these images from the X3 bucket to LakeFS repository. Uh, we are just creating a point test to those files. So even if you select 1,000 files, 10,000 images, this import process will be very quick. So if I go here uh, and look into my branch, go into this branch in LakeFS repository, I have this raw data set now with the images. Uh, and in this case, I just imported the 100 images. So, and also the image mask. The image mask is stored the information about the ships in those images or boats in those images. So if I go into my, this data set, uh, this is all images here, uh, which I, we imported into LakeFS repository. So just quickly look into those, one of those. 
Yeah, I don't see any boats there's, here. There's a lot of ships here. Yeah, a yeah, lot of images have don't have any boats or ships. So we are going to filter those images also, which don't have any uh, boats or ships. Yeah. And also and, just quickly here, uh, specify about the object. If you go into object info, as you can see here, this image is uh, pointing to this file on S3 bucket. So we are not making a copy. We just have a pointer to that certain file. Good, thank you. And I think I forgot one more thing while doing the demo, the question, but uh, the poll, I'll come back to this when yeah. I'm running this demo. Uh, when I have time and I will ask that question also. Okay, so now I have my images imported into LakeFS with using zero copy operation, uh, zero clone copy. And next thing is uh, I'm going to work locally with this data set. So I'm going to just set up some uh, variables here. If I am working locally versus in the distributed environment, when I run in distributed environment, I'm going to read directly from the repository, but for local, I'm going to uh, copy or download those uh, images locally. So as Ido mentioned earlier, we recently came out with this feature. Uh, Lake CTL is the command line interface CLI for LakeFS. And then we have added this local functionality here where you can clone everything locally, work locally, commit your changes to the LakeFS server. So I'm going to just clone this branch in this case. So I'm going to clone the, my repo and experiment branch in that repo to a particular path here. So this is my path here, which I am very sp specified here. So I cloned this, uh, this, all these images inside this Git repo uh, in this particular folder. So if I go here, all these images are available here also. Let me try another one. Uh, this one also doesn't have any boards. So now I have all my files locally inside a Git repo. One thing I want to mention how like we work together with Git. So we are going to use Git to version control your code. In this case, it will be these notebooks, or it can be any Python, Spark program, whatever code you have, you will use Git for version controlling that, and LakeFS for version controlling your data. So when you clone this, uh, all these images locally inside this Git repository, a lot of time people ask the question, now if I commit my changes to Git repo, it's going to commit those like lots of images also, and Git doesn't support the big data. So what we do is when you clone this uh, LakeFS branch locally, we add that particular folder in the git ignore file. So git is going to ignore any files inside this folder in this LakeFS local folder. Uh, it can be any folder name. I just specified this as a variable here. And, but it's not going to ignore this uh, YAML file that we create. And that YAML file includes the information, LakeFS commit information. So in this YAML file, for example, uh, we have this source, which includes the repos LakeFS repository name, the branch name, and the commit ID. So this is basically point, it tells you that for, uh, for a particle, let's say when you commit your changes into Git, along with your code, it's going to commit the YAML file which includes all the information about the like FS commit for your data set. So then that way you have code plus data together uh, in a single commit in, in, in Git. And also this commit ID is basically here. If you go into like FS and look for these commits, so you'll see this is the same commit ID as this one after importing your data set images initial. So that's how we work together uh, with Git. So now, Next thing what I'll do is let's look into like whether we can read this data set, which is locally uh, using a Spark. In this case, I'm just read uh, these images in the Spark data frame uh, and to guess the width and height in this case, for example. So you can see we have all these images and it's re reading locally. This is my container a path here. And it, this is my local folder inside this. So that's what I'm going to use for my training the model, everything locally here. Next thing I'm going to build my data pipeline. Uh, I think this will take about a few minutes to run, four or five minutes to run the pipeline. 
we are using Medallion architecture. I'll explain everything, but let me run this pipeline. So it runs in the background and I can explain everything. So let's go back to this picture. So what we did is uh, initially we took those these images, satellite images, about 200,000, download those uh, about 100 images in this case for my local experimentation, uh, read that and convert into a delta table. So read is in the binary format, convert into my bronze data set. Uh, so we had raw data set. After converting, it's a bronze data set. So we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are using the medallion architecture in this case. Then we are going to enhance our images, resize those images, uh, as well as transform the mask into images. So mask, as I mentioned, it's a CSV file. That mask tells you the location of the ships on this images, if there are boats or ships in the image. So it will tell you the location information. So we transfer that, that mask into also images and can save this as a silver data set. And again, all these data sets are getting stored in Lake FS repository. I'll show you that in a second. And then we take that silver data set uh, and join the images with the mask. So we have the satellite images and then we have masking information where the boats are in those images. We join those together to create the gold data set. And that's what you see here in this picture. So for example, for this satellite images, there are two boats here or multiple boats here. They're hard to see all the boats here. So we will count also the number of boats. In this case, this image has now four boats. And here also, this one also has four board. So that's what uh, right now uh, we were running in this pipeline and saving everything into like FS repository in different uh, uh, in like different data sets like bronze, silver, and gold. So if I go back to my like FS repository for that particular branch, local experiment branch. So now I have my raw data set, my bronze, silver, and gold data set. Everything is. Uh, saved in LakeFS repository for version control purpose. And also we tag it. So in future, if you want, you can look for the data set using the tag instead of using the commit ID because commit ID is long ID, it's hard to remember. So you can put the tag also the way, any way you want to use the tag, it's up to you. So that's what I did in the in my code. I tagged also all these my data sets. Next, I'm going to train my model locally. So in this case, uh, we are using this image segmentation model. Um, uh, it's, pu it's publicly available. Uh, it's, uh, and that's what library we are using here. It's in the code here. I'm not going to too much get into too much on the ML code, but that's what we are using. So once we train this model, it gives you the, the output for the metric which you are using to measure the performance of this model. Uh, again, this is a small data set, so you may not get very good output from this. So that's where we are going to train this model in a scale, still using LakeFS, everything same data set, and then we'll train this model in, in a scale on uh, in distributed computing environment also. So once you train this model after this is done, you might run this experiment multiple times, so you can create multiple branches here. I did just one branch local experiment one, but you can run this model or this uh, notebook multiple times by incrementing the branch name and run the same process every time with different image set. Uh, so you can initially I started with 100, you can go with 500,000, whatever you can afford to run on your local laptop and then create another branch and train the model again with different image set. And then we are recording all those model training experimentation in ML flow. Uh, so just we'll let's look into the best model that we got. In this case, right now I just did one training, one experiment. So it's going to just tell me what oh, this is your best model. But in real life, you will run it multiple times and it will select the best model based on the, the metric value. And then you can store this best model information in like FS repository. Uh, so, and let me commit this and I'll show you how it looks in LakeFS repository. So let me go here in my branch here. So in, in LakeFS, we are just keeping the data set for version control. The model, actual model will be stored in MLflow artifact. I'll show you that. But if this includes, we are including the best model information in LakeFS repository for linkage purpose. purpose. 
So this will tell you uh, where the artifact is stored, that model is stored, uh, what was the run which you ran, what time and what metrics you used, sorry, what's the parameters you used, what was the output metric output was. And there are a lot of tags we add when we're running this model. And I'll show you some of those tags later. So that tag information is also stored in, in, this, uh, in this particular file. Okay, let's go back here. And next, once uh, you, let's say you train the model many times and you want to select the best model and make it production ready. Uh, when you run in distributed environment, you might run lots of models in parallel, train the models in parallel, and then select the best model and make it production ready. And then uh, next thing I want to show is about going back to the integration with Git, uh, how it looks like. So what I'm going to do is use Git to version control my data. So these are my notebooks, which has my all the code. So I'm going to call. I'm I just copied those files into uh, my uh, Git repository here. Uh, so these are my two files or two notebooks that I'm going to version control in Git, but not the data set. So if you see here, when I add my files into Git staging area and just check the status, you can see here, I'm going to version control these two notebooks using Git and the YAML file, LakeFS YAML file, which has the LakeFS commit information. So that way you have all the information together here. So like this is my code, and this is my LakeFS commit information. So you can go and look into LakeFS to get the data set for that at that time. This is, does that work? Yeah. This is where I ended uh, Amit's uh, presentation. Actually, the next phase of this is showing the work with MLflow. So you can just, uh, let's go back to the presentation. Um, you can uh, follow this sample and get also get this information. Um, on our YouTube channel and you can watch the whole thing or you can run it yourself using the sample. Uh, we are out of time, but on the other hand, the next talk is only in 10 minutes, so we can steal the room. If you have any questions that you would like to ask about the concept or about the demo, I'm happy to answer. Here is, here is the uh, barcode for the sample again, and this is the information about the uh, open source project, the data version could pull over open source project if you want to use. All those nice logos down there are actually companies using the project already. Um, so uh, it's uh, very successful in adoption. It's already four years old, so uh, it's been used before. <laughs> in very high scale. So no worries if you want to try it. Okay, you can also uh, join the Slack channel if you have any questions. No questions? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>